welcome uh, everyone uh, for joining us uh, to this uh, ex external seminar um, of the series of um, uh, City Ready External Seminar Series. This um, Wednesday, we have the pleasure to have uh, Levi Wolf uh, from uh, the University of Bristol. Um, Levi Wolf is a senior lecturer at the University of Will, uh, Bristol, but also fellow at the University of Chicago Center for Spatial Data Science and also uh, with the Alan uh, Turing Institute. Uh, he works on building better methods uh, and models to understand society and our environment and has published papers on elections, inequality, uh, demographic change. Uh, so he is uh, heavily involved uh, in the open science movement, maintaining and contributing to a variety of software packages and he's also writing an open book on geographic data science with uh, Serge Ray uh, and Daniel Arribel, uh, Arribas Bell um, at, uh, from the University of Liverpool. Uh, so uh, you all probably uh, will uh, also um, um, think uh, the same as me that he uh, is a, a person uh, very much aligned to the interest of uh, people at City Ready and also at uh, the University of Birmingham, but also we have the presence today of attendees from other uh, universities uh, in the UK. So uh, it's great to have you all here and it's great to have Levi here as well. So Levi, uh, please, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so let me share my screen and confirm that everybody can see the slides. Yes, looks great. Okay, cool. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, my name is Levi Wolf. Uh, and as said, I'm a, a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol. Um, this work is some work that I actually have been working on for a very, very long time, uh, at least in terms of my academic career. Uh, this goes back all the way to my second year of graduate school. Uh, all the way back in 2016. <laughs> and this work is uh, published in the Annals of the American Geographers, and it's all on the way that we think about place and space in uh, multi-level models in particular. So uh, my colleagues, Luke Anselin at uh, University of Chicago, Daniel Erebus Bell at the University of Liverpool, and Lee Rivers Mobley, uh, who was at, I believe, Georgia Tech, um, who is now retired uh, and the work, I should say, uh, at the outset was funded by the National Institutes of Health in the US. So um, to proceed here, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how um, geographical models or really geographical information enters into models that are commonly used in regional science and planning. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how these notions of geography enter into like a classic linear regression um, and talk a lot, a little bit about the problems of using the uh, strategy known as a multi-level model in uh, sort of analyzing urban and regional systems. Then I'll show a little bit about how standard multi-level models can be a bit problematic when you're dealing with geographical data. So to proceed here, we'll start off with a little bit about this, what I'm calling a core tension in geographical analysis. And those of you who come from a geography background are familiar with this divide, that there's sort of notions of space and notions of place. And you might have spatial data scientists and you might have what are called placial data scientists. And they generally are interested in different theories and processes and uh, indeed entirely different representations sometimes of the same processes. And while there's a little bit of work that aims to kind of bridge this gap, um, I don't think you're ever going to get me to say that word. It doesn't really fit well in my, in my mouth. So I'm just going to just avoid that for now. Um, so when we're talking about these two kind of ideas of, and representations, um, I, I'd like to explain it like this, that space is a, about the geographic system over which an object of study relates to other objects, right? So in uh, an urban environment, we might be thinking about road networks, you know, how businesses might uh, interact with one another and how far away the effective distance is between them. Um, you know, a lot of the study of, I don't know, like atmospheric sciences and things like that are much more about spatial analysis than they are about placial analysis. Uh, and, you know, sort of classical theories of like gravity models and things like that are, are space-based analyses. Now, a place-based framework or a placial framework is one that thinks of sort of 
the objects of study are geographical entities that are constructed by their distinctiveness. That means that they kind of emerge from sort of the socioeconomic tapestry, per se. So lots of classic work in regional science focuses on the analysis of places. Lots of the literature on, say, neighborhood effects and deprivation, all of that is place-based work. It's about how this kind of distinctive geographical entity affects the things inside of it. So naturally speaking, this means that our modes of inquiry when we're dealing with place-based research tend to be a little bit different. You know, you're, you're more interested in how or why places emerge and what their properties are. So these are like looking at estimating, you know, what is the effect of a neighborhood on my life, uh, life expectancy over the life course. Whereas a space-based analysis is much more interested in the interactions between things. So this, you know, again, as, as I said, if you can think of the classic kind of gravity model of trade and interaction, you know, we're interested in estimating a friction of distance coefficient. We're looking at, you know, how far away do you have to go in order for you to be, you know, it to be too expensive for you to trade with someone else. So that's kind of like the spatial mode of analysis in contrast to the placial mode. Now, the interesting thing is when we're talking about statistical models, this gives us two entirely different notions of dependence or correlation. And for the spatial perspective, you can think of spatial dependence as summarized by the sort of famous geographical first law, right? That nearby things are more related than distant things. If we're close to one another, in some you know, distance metric, doesn't matter, then we're likely to have co-evolutionary outcomes. We're not going to be able to be considered as separate. But if we're far apart, we can act independently. So that's kind of what we mean by spatial dependence, that nearby things uh, co-emerge. Place has this notion of placial dependence, that things in the same place can be expected to be more related than things in different places. And at first glance, these two things appear to be kind of the same. But there are subtle differences between how these things are operationalized in statistical models that have some pretty dramatic consequences when they get in sort of attention. And I'll show you what this means in a second. But for now, just keep it in mind about this difference between thinking about spatial dependence where nearby things are more related than distant things, and placial dependence, where things in the same place are considered related. For me to talk about these things, I'm going to develop them in a bit of a statistical framework. And it's going to uh, sort of walk through the ways in which we typically represent spatial and placial dependence. So we'll actually need more than one classic model. We'll need a couple of models. And what I hope to do is show you how, you know, when we combine all these different kinds of effects together, we get some unexpected behavior. So starting off, a classic example of a modeling problem might be that we're trying to predict outcomes at, let's say, a county level in the US. And to do this, I might have some very simple linear regression equation where I have a uh, sort of matrix representation with y being my outcome of interest that I'm interested in modeling, and x is my sort of exogenous covariates that I think predict my outcome, and beta indicates how those exogenous covariates are related to my outcome. E is that error term that indicates, you know, how far off of my regression line every single y is, right? So this is a classic kind of thing. In a geographical context, you can read this as sort of saying that the outcome at site two is a function of our measurements at site two plus a random error term. Very simple. Now, the classical regression model can't tell you the difference between this map and this map. All I've done is I've shuffled the rows of the data matrix and kept the linkages to geography the same. You will get the same regression from this map, as you will, from this map. Because the orders of the rows don't necessarily matter for linear regression, and their correspondence to a geographical context isn't necessarily important. In an ordinary least squares model, you cannot tell the difference between two maps. 
unless you figure out a way to measure properties of that map. The rest of the talk will be about ways that we do that. So another kind of more plausible map that we might model looks something like this. And in this map, you can kind of see different state-based outcomes, right? So you see that like the state of Utah is really yellow out the west, and you see that Florida and Mississippi are really blue down in the south. And in order to model this, sometimes uh, you know, regional scientists will use what's called the spatial fixed effect. And this indicates that every sort of grouping in geography has its own special little uh, conditional mean. So here I've represented that with the same individual level factors that we saw before, but I've now included this special little group factor term that tells me that each of the states might have a different conditional mean. Okay, so this is generally called a state fixed effect model. And it's really simple. You just throw in dummy variables for every county within a state. So there are, you know, n counties and j states. So you have for each row, you have um, a one in the column if it pertains to a specific state. So it's just a dummy variable set up here. Usually you have to omit a state or you have to fit some kind of special form of this model. Uh, but this is pretty classically done. It's just a dummy variable based on your group. In econometrics, we would call this a group fixed effects model. And all we're trying to do is give groups separate intercepts. Okay, so this is classically a way to just, you know, get rid of the heterogeneity, get rid of the fact that states are different and move on. Well, in the statistics literature, there's this whole uh, concept behind multi-level models where, you know, we can just say that states are different and move on, but there might be some relevant state level factors that we need to think about. Some states might have more observations than others. Some states might adopt, say, different policies that result in different outcomes at the county level. So we need to account for the fact that the differences between states might actually have some data generating process itself. When you have models at different levels, when you're thinking about having sort of models for how things will change, you have a multi-level model. It's nested in the sense that there's a regression equation for the counties and then another equation for the states. So you can see the counties here and then the states there. That theoretical model for how the higher level varies is the model for you. Now, you know, in this case, A would be a grand mean, ZY would be some kind of group level exogenous effects, and uh, gamma would be the relationship between those group level exogenous effects and our kind of group level varying factors. We also have this notion of a group level error term, but other people might know this as a group level random or mixed effect, okay? Now, why do we use multi-level models instead of just using a fixed effect? Well, there's some really good statistical theory that suggests that even without all the extra data, using a multi-level model or a mixed effect model will give you more precise estimates of your heterogeneity, but those estimates will be slightly biased towards either the grand mean or zero, depending on what we're, we're talking about here. I'll just refer to the random effects being biased to zero. Okay, so multi-level models are used because they give more precise but slightly biased estimates of group level heterogeneity. And they're useful because that then turns what might be, say, a null result for a place with very few observations into a statistically significant result because I've used the strength, I've borrowed sort of information from that higher level model to make uh, statistically significant determinations of difference. So multi-level models are used all the time in this context when we have different numbers of observations in our groups. Now, talking a little bit behind how these models are estimated, um, the fixed effect estimates are generally just the means of our group. If I ignore all of the exogenous data, very, very simple. If I'm gonna fit a fixed effect model with no exogenous variables, I'm just gonna predict Y is the mean of every single group I look at. It's a really simple estimate. The multi-level model has a structural relationship to that estimate. The multi-level model 
shrinks from the OLS estimate to become smaller. As I say here, it's biased towards zero. Well, what does this biasing factor look like? Well, it's a function of your between group variation. It's a function of your within group variation. And it's a function of your group size. So kind of the folk wisdom is that small groups will shrink more than big groups. Problems where your groups are really noisy, uh, they'll tend to shrink more. And problems with like really similar groups will also tend to shrink quite a bit. So that's what a multi-level model does. And it has this kind of idea that observations within my group are likely more similar to me than to others, right? There's these state level heterogeneities that I'm accounting for. For those of you paying attention, this is placial dependence. Now there's a problem with this kind of thinking that attacks this angle that is place really just about group. And I'm calling multi-level models here an accidentally geographic model for the following reason. If I'm fitting a model in the US and I want to account for state level heterogeneity, but you might need to deal with Texas. As you may know, Texas is a very different kind of state. And we usually have to deal with that because it is weird. You know, everything is bigger there in addition to a lot of other things. So if I'm dealing with Texas in my multi-level model or in my fixed effect model, I'm going to have this weird, you know, carve out to deal with the fact that it's there. A multi-level model cannot tell the difference between this Texas and that Texas. So they're the same thing to the model. You can shuffle it again. The geographical locations get exploded all around the US, but the model estimates will still be the same. This means that multi-level models are only geographic if our groups are geographic. And this is one of their strengths. They're incredibly general. Unfortunately, when it comes to spatial processes, it means that the model doesn't actually care that it's a spatial process. It's just about groups. It still can't tell the difference between all these different maps that I could give it. And indeed, you can construct some really funny situations where a multi-level model looks like it's working well, but makes really odd geographical predictions. One way we deal with this is to talk about spatial dependence and actually treat the fact that nearby things are related. The typical way that, at least in the, the literature I uh, participate in, deals with this is using an autoregressive process. And usually, I like to deal with simultaneous autoregressive processes because they have some nice properties. In a simultaneous autoregressive process, you're kind of saying that you cannot predict me separately from my neighbor. They kind of co-evolve. And here I'll be talking about a, a simultaneous process in the error term. I might call these a SAR model because it's a little bit easier to, to say while I'm talking. So in a SAR model, for just including it for an error term, my prediction error at some county or site is kind of constructed from this average of surrounding sites plus an intrinsic error at that site. What this means is if you kind of, if I'm overestimated, my neighbors will probably also be overestimated as long as that lambda is positive. Of course, we see cases where it's negative, but that, I digress. When lambda is positive, which is the vast majority of cases, the way you interpret this is that if you say that I'm too large, you're also gonna say my neighbors are too large. And there's a lot of kind of algorithmic fairness implications in this kind of thing. We're trying to correct for the fact that, you know, our mispredictions tend to be clustered and, and we're, we're trying to even out our errors over space. The cool thing is that you can still have a group level model in these frameworks. So I can still have spatial dependence and deal with the fact that nearby things are related while I'm also addressing the fact that groups have some dependent structure and that places may be related. So I'd like to sort of leave you with this kind of pithy little notion of a SAR model that your surroundings matter. And that in the sort of multi-level model, it's that your group matters. So why do we use SAR models beyond the fact that they have this neat little sort of representation of geography? Well, when I use this kind of autoregressive process and I account for the fact that nearby things are related, I'm actually kind of reducing the amount of information that I have because I'm saying that I'm actually not an independent observation from my neighbor. 
So I might have n observations, but in fact, I need to like deflate that amount because I actually don't have n independent bits of information. What happens here is generally speaking, that you get no change in your estimates. You know, if I estimate a model with OLS and I estimate a model with a spatial error model, I get the same point estimates, asymptotically speaking, and generally in small samples, it's also true. In this case, it will be. But my confidence intervals tend to expand. That's because I don't actually have the amount of information I think I have. I've got these correlations between observations that are nearby that kind of reduce the amount of information I'm dealing with. So in this case, our estimates become the same, but they become less certain. So we get the same estimates, but they increase in uncertainty. So when we're thinking about mixing these two things together, the simplest possible way to kind of specify this spatial multi-level model um, is one where you might have these two separate processes and you might have a, spa a simultaneous autoregressive process at each level, right? So in the blue, you have a county level model and in the red, you have a state level model and both of them might actually deal with the fact that nearby counties are related to one another and nearby states are related to one another. So this genre of model is what I'm talking about today. So it's a model that both takes into account place and space. And it also applies to restrictions of this model. So where you only have a spatial process at one level, or you just have a multi-level process, et cetera. OK? So this actually causes three different things to happen. You have response level spatial dependence. You have the group level spatial dependence, and you also get the placial dependence. That's a natural feature of multi-level models. OK. Does it really matter that you can take care of all these things at once and that, you know, would a restriction be better to use? Or, you know, why does it matter that we can treat space and place at the same time? Well, what I'd like to say here is that one bad nut can spoil this baklava. Space and place will interact with one another in unpredictable and complex ways and they can seriously affect the results that you manage to take away from the model. So to recap why we use these structures in the first place, I said that we use a simultaneous autoregressive model in our error terms because it can capture geographic similarity. It can correct for our artificially precise estimates, because remember, we don't actually have the information we think we do. And it generally speaking leaves the estimates alone in expectation. So asymptotically, they should be the same. We use multi-level models because they capture this kind of group or placial similarity. They make our group level estimates more certain. Their confidence intervals shrink. In addition, they tend to bias the estimates, so they change them asymptotically, uh, and particularly strongly so for small groups or in noisy situations, as I discussed when mentioning the shrinkage factor. For those of you that are, again, paying attention, you'll note that these behaviors are intrinsically opposed. If I have a spatial process, my estimates do one thing. If I have a multi-level process, my estimates do a different thing. And the things that they do are in direct tension with one another. The spatial model estimates will remain the same. The multi-level model estimates will change in expected value. The spatial model estimates will decrease in their certainty. The multi-level model estimates will increase in their certainty. So what happens when we use them together? Who knows? We do. In this paper in the annals, we look at families of this type of model and find general mathematical results for all models that share a specific kind of correlation structure. We then demonstrate some empirical results uh, that kind of illustrate this process on a common model specification. And uh, we do this because we're kind of concerned about the fact that we're seeing these specifications in the wild being applied to data, and you get these really good estimates of model fit, but there wasn't really any formal mathematical work defining why we were seeing these processes happen in the first place. And this paper makes two central claims about the intersection of spatial and placial models. We say that Classic multi-level models will understate the uncertainty of regional parameter estimates and overstate their magnitude when you have spatial dependence at either level of your model. 
So a classical multi-level model may understate uncertainty and overstate magnitude of heterogeneity effects. In addition, intuition be new variants can show up as substantive because of this spatial autoregressive structure. Because of this spatial autoregressive structure, things kind of bleed over and get confused. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these uh, and some, provide some empirical proof. First off, though, this intuition part is about the mathematics. Earlier, I showed you this expression relating a, a multi-level model to an OLS model. And I talked about the different factors that cause shrinkage from an OLS model to a multi-level model estimate in the simplest case. When you introduce spatial dependence, things become a little bit more challenging. You have to deal with the fact that observations are related to one another. You can't really separate individual observations. Oh, I think I'm missing a delta there. That should be delta F prime F delta. Anyway, um, the, uh, the things become a lot more complicated. The cool thing is, is that the mathematical form still remains the same. So for those of you that are familiar with mathematical expressions like this, and you can do matrix algebra, you know that the region level term all the way on the right is just like the region level term that you see on top. Same position, mathematically speaking. And you see that this response level variance term occupies, again, a sort of similar place. And then this, the term that captures the spatial dependence, F here is a spatial correlation function uh, of a particular form, uh, something called a separable covariance, which 99% you know, of all spatial covariance functions that you see in the wild are called separable. Um, this is our sort of spatial factor. And you see that it corresponds to the number of observations in a group in a classical multi-level model. So when you do this spatial smoothing, when you deal with the fact that nearby things are related, as in the, the sort of simple case, I said that it kind of deflates the number of affected observations. This also happens here. However, omega is a region level term describing the dependence among regions. And F is a covariance matrix between response or county level variance in this case. So you actually get bleed between the effective number of observations at the state and county level. You can't separate their variation. Your effective number of parameters within your group depends on the other groups around it, which you, is, is not at all a normal behavior for a, for a multi-level model. In a multi-level model, all you have to do is deal with different numbers in each group. The other estimates are, are basically constant when you're estimating the, the shrinkage factor. So you do have this similar form, right? And you get the fact that this sort of spatial dependence operates as the number of effective observations inside of a group. So you have to totally update the fact that the nuisance level variation at your state level, at your regional level, can show up as substantive dependence and thus affect shrinkage at the county level. Your within between across dependence cannot ever be separated in this model. So we can't just look at an individual estimate and provide you with a closed form solution. What we can do is we can look at this entire shrinkage matrix, which is what I'm gonna do now. So to do that, um, remember when I talked about this model, which has the multi-level model with possible spatial dependencies at each, each sort of level. Uh, what I do is I sort of turn off each of the different processes. So you get six models in total. You can think of it as two versions of a single level model, which is like the spatial fixed effect and the spatial error model. And then you also have the classical multi-level model, which just has Y and U. You can also then introduce spatial error terms at the county, the state, and both levels. So I'm showing you the behavior here across all those different variants, and it all has the same sort of mathematical form. When you visualize this shrinkage factor, how the, the estimates are relating to one another, and the, it's also the structural relationship between standard OLS and the estimates from this model, you can see that in some cases you get positive feedbacks between neighboring observations in the sense that they're giving strength. 
And in some cases, you actually get negative spillovers, cases where the surrounding observations are removing strength from that uh, group, removing sort of effective information. That happens in the model where you have spatial dependence only at the county level. And this kind of makes sense because if you assume that that dependence is coming from county to county spillovers, you need to subtract that off of the state level information. So this only depends on those three factors we talked about before, the, the what so-called shrinkage factor in multi-level models. These, you can't separate those terms. And it gets really complicated really quickly about how these uh, things relate to one another. You can see at the end that in the, um, in the dual case where you have both county and state level spillovers, some values are positive and some are negative. Even in the upper level only, some values are positive and some are negative. This means that spillovers can both increase and decrease the effective sample size. Overall, there are some conditions that guarantee that you're always going to shrink, but the magnitude can be very, very different between states depending on the structure of the dependence. Okay, so remember that the response level still drives most of this variation. This will be shown again later, uh, but it, it's mainly to say that when you have a lot of observations that are really strongly dependent, it's going to matter more than having a few observations that are weakly dependent. So the state level model in this case doesn't have as much influence over shrinkage and variance as the county level model. So it's important to specify that correctly. So I showed you how our sort of mathematical intuition needs to change. Now I'd like to show you what happens to the estimates, because that's what everybody is here for, right? Nobody's here to think about the mathematical forms of dependence and how they vary and all that bullshit. They're here to talk about how heterogeneity matters or if it doesn't. So I'll show you a table of those estimates now. It's a lot to take in. I'm not going to talk about them all. But what you can see are the six models that I've referred to for every state. In uh, an analysis of the introduction of the Medicare fee-for-service program in the US, the data doesn't really matter at this point, but we've basically introduced this program and we're trying to tell if state level differences are resulting in differences in how people use colonoscopy screenings. So differences in the states matter because it suggests that state level policies have affected the implementation of the national program. And you can see immediately that I get a lot of different lines within each state. Some are long, some are short, some of them shrink and some of them don't, and it varies by state. So breaking it down, these are the 95 posterior density intervals for Arizona's intercept in a model predicting colorectal cancer uptake among Medicare recipients after this program, the Medicare fee-for-service program, is started. The cool tone colors have no spatial dependence among counties. So they assume that counties are independent, but possibly related within their states. The warm tone colors have response level spatial dependence. So this is where counties are related to nearby counties. And remember before I said that this is the important part. This will generally speaking be more important because it's bigger matrices, they have stronger spillovers, you know, they, they affect the model more, they have more leverage. The long bars are our fixed effect estimates generated from maximum likelihood. So the, the teal bar basically is the OLS estimate uh, for a spatial fixed effect model. And the orange bar is the spatial error estimate when you include the, the spatial fixed effect. So it's like spatial fixed effect plus a spatial error model. The short bars involve some sort of multi-level model. So they're going to include some kind of shrinkage that reduces the length of that confidence interval. So they're always going to be including some, ooh, sorry. I, uh, uh, am I back on my sharing screen? Hello? Yes, I'm good. Okay, sorry about that. I, I don't know why that showed up. Um, so I have these uh, short bars, which represent the multi-level estimates uh, that are obtained using a Bayesian technique. Um, and so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about some of the general patterns that relate the sort of different forms of models. So here I've got Arizona and North Carolina to demonstrate my two examples, okay? So remember, my argument is that classical multi-level models may understate the uncertainty of the region level parameter estimates and overstate their magnitude. So if I'm looking at North Carolina, I can see that all of my multi-level estimates, the shorter bars, 
improve uncertainty. So my confidence interval is narrow, right? By definition, they're the shorter bars visually. However, the ones that model regional spatial dependence shrink less. They're still longer than the other ones. So those are the, the sort of pink and yellow models. So when you include county level dependence, your estimates still shrink, but they don't shrink as much as the corresponding cool tone color model. This means that, so comparing say the purple to the pink or the green to the yellow, that a classical multi-level model will be overconfident about its estimate if there's spatial dependence that remains untreated. This is another example. All of the multi-level model estimates shrink towards zero when we're talking about Arizona. But the ones that model response level spatial dependence, the, the warm tone colors, they shrink more strongly. They get smaller. The classic multi-level model then is exaggerated in its point estimate. It's too big because it assumes that there are no spillovers happening both within the state and across state lines in the amount of information that's contained. Okay, so that's what I mean when I say classic multi-level models may understate the uncertainty, it may be too narrow of confidence intervals, and they might overstate the magnitude. The point estimates might be too large. Now this is pretty cool because these are together an emergent behavior that you wouldn't expect from each one alone. If I just think about the SAR, the, the spatial model, I would expect there to be no change in my estimate. If I think about the multi-level model, I expect there to be a shrinkage towards zero. If I add those things together, I would expect to get something in between those two, either no change or a slight change. What we actually see is when we add them together, a more dramatic change. So you can't just assume that the single level estimates and the multi-level estimates and this more complex model will fall somewhere between the two. You cannot assume that. Sometimes introducing spatial dependence in a palatial model will actually significantly change the results and the expected behavior. So I gave this talk to um, a collection of urban economists and they said that, you know, you're saying that multi-level models you know, are overconfident and exaggerated in a takeaway. In a classic econometric fashion, they said, why don't you say that the spatial model is conservative and understated? You know, why is it the case that we're focused on the multi-level model as the reference, and you're not sort of focusing on the fact that this weird complicated model that deals with spatial dependencies uh, may actually be too conservative? You know, what's the real model here and how can you tell? And that's usually a great question as economists are wont to ask. So I went in and did a little bit more work. And I looked at primarily the effective dependence that comes out of these models. Now there's no like closed form walled test yet to determine or like a Hausman kind of specification search to figure out, you know, what is the correct specification here, but we can do inferences on the variance and the dependence. And in this case, all of our spatial dependence parameters were pretty big and pretty significant. In addition, the spatial patterning of our state level heterogeneity gets stronger when we allow for the dependence in the model. So there's definitely some kind of borrowing going on, and that borrowing is resulting in stronger effective dependence and statistically significant parameter estimates for dependence inside of the model. So there's dependence there. The dependence is statistically significant, and it changes the spatial structure of your estimates. If there's not a better argument for including dependence, I don't know what there would be. The variation is significant and it does change the model. So you need to account for it if that's the case. Then the changes you see in significance become very important. So it's gonna be autocorrelated no matter what. It's gonna be significant in most cases. So we really should account for it. Don't just ignore it. And then assume that your estimates will be overconfident and uh, uh, exaggerated. So today I've sort of presented this and I'll just close on a short recap. I've, I've talked a bit, little bit about this geographic dichotomy uh, and a little, little bit of the classic models. Um, and I've 
provided this is narrative, that space and place are kind of core theoretical constructs to geography and geographical analysis. And that uh, spatial analysis or spatial analysts, excuse me, have been using these concepts to structure their models ever since the sort of late 80s, early 90s. Baked into these specifications are these theories. And the way that these theories emerge are important. Multi-level models are only accidentally spatial models in the sense that you've designed the groups to be spatial. Because they don't deal with spatial information, they actually can be overconfident about how much of the variation is due to place. Once you include them in the model, they become less confident and less certain. So that's kind of the talk on place and space and multi-level models. Again, you know, none of this work would have been possible without Luke and Lee and sort of mentorship from Danny at the time and the National Institutes of Health for funding us to try and uh, uh, figure out these sort of state level differences in colonoscopy uptake. So I'm happy to take questions at this point and thank you very much for having me. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I think it has been superb. Um, uh, I have to say that uh, Levi is part of uh, the Facebook project uh, that um, uh, I am coordinating together with Emanuele Tranos also at the University of Bristol. And uh, we are hopeful, hopefully we are going to apply some of these uh, models uh, to uh, analyze the effect of the digital economy on the leveling up in the UK. So very much looking forward to do that. Um, just now, uh, let me open um, the round for questions and comments, uh, please. Um, uh, let me just see if anyone has any question at this stage. Please raise your hand. No, I can't see anyone. Okay, so I, I ask one. Oh yes, Ted, please. So I was just wondering about your spatial weights matrix. You know, spatial dependence is is a. Uh, you know, great, but you know, do you don't have to assume something arbitrary, more or less, about how things are connected? How do you kind of deal with that issue? Yeah, so um, here I'm just using a county level queen matrix. Uh, my thinking on this is informed by a paper that Jim LeSage wrote called The Biggest Myth in Spatial Econometrics. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Uh, but in it, he kind of looks at how different specifications of the weights matrix change the effective parameter estimates. And he finds that for a pretty large class, you generally don't see a difference in effective parameter estimates. Now you have to be careful about what you're comparing because in, a, uh, in an autoregressive lag model, beta is not the effect, it's just an estimate. It doesn't represent the marginal effect. But if you compare apples to apples, you get generally the same results for different weight specifications. So I think there's been a lot of fighting about this kind of arbitrary choice. And to me, I see it again, as a Bayesian, about all the fights about priors. Yeah, sure, you got to make some subjective choices to do science. If you do it, do a sensitivity analysis and move on. Be rigorous about what you've done, but don't obsess over it. So that's kind of my philosophy. Sounds very reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. I also have questions about, um, so um, you have already been uh, in the UK for uh, for a bit. Uh, so I'm wondering if, uh, what is your reflection about um, uh, the multi-level geographical level uh, in, in, in the UK and also uh, the big effect of London? So what I'm thinking about is that, you know, when we are uh, dealing with um, spatial uh, models, we are many times uh, taking into consideration the bordering uh, geography, you know, but not that much how much uh, the impact of uh, big, in particular capital cities, might uh, go far beyond uh, uh, that they are geographically close uh, by or not uh, to certain areas. So um, not only in terms of uh, the spillovers that they might uh, generate, but also in terms of how much they suck in terms of, uh, uh, you know, prosperity, in terms of uh, talent, in terms of many things that, uh, of course, uh, it can be uh, not uh, massively linked to geography sometimes because they are more mobile somehow, but uh, they might influence the results uh, quite a lot. So um, can you just reflect on this, please? Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I never really was sensitized to it until I was in the U UK and, and saw how much <laughs> London drives the, the statistical results you see. There, there are two 
things that I think are useful going forward with that kind of thing, right? So we know a little bit about the right kinds of hierarchies that we need to use. And one of those, instead of thinking sort of naively about administrative containers and the ways in which those are bigger or smaller, um, there's some really great work by Peter Taylor on the city system, right? About how these hierarchies of cities exist and, and those things are also functionally related and dependent. Um, and those things can be built into multi-level models and they're generally not used. So, you know, I think some of the, the issues with how multi-level models have been fit in the past is that they're focused very narrowly on, you know, administrative divisions, nesting within administrative divisions and so on. Um, but there's been some really innovative work that we need to think about that, you know, reminds us that it's just about group. And if you can define these city systems, you can come up with robust estimates that avoid kind of falling into these traps of, well, London's really particular, but it's just another, you know, metropolitan government. And it sits at the same level as other metropolitan governments. And maybe that's not the right hierarchy to use. Again, that's kind of a subjective design decision where nobody ever gets fired for choosing local authorities and LSOAs inside of them. But maybe that's not right. And so we need to think a little bit more about the representational decisions we take there. There's nothing mathematical that, you know, <laughs> picks London out or not. So, so that would be one thing, I think, using the city system. Um, and then sort of the other kind of challenge then is coming up with real importance model criticism measures. And, you know, my, my whole uh, doctoral dissertation was on, on model criticism and gerrymandering, basically, and how um, you have to be really seriously attentive to the decisions you make when you do that. Um, and again, I think alongside there being a dearth of formal methods, formal mathematical analysis on these things, there's also not a lot of interest anymore in that kind of stuff in geography. You know, really early on, like you think about like the Anselin Moran's eye was originally thought of as a regression outlier statistic on the Moran form regression, right? So there's all these ways that we can do sensitivity analysis and outlier analysis that we don't, we have computers that are massive and we can do all sorts of cross validation and things but uh, we don't do it. And, you know, you look at Google Scholar for spatial cross-validation and most of the methods are in ecology. So I think that that's gonna be like the next big area that we need to deal with things like how much London, as you say, sucks. Um, but uh, I, I don't think that there's a closed form solution for that yet, other than picking better representations and getting better at model criticism. Uh, but I mean, following up very shortly, I think I'm taking advantage of being the chair on, on this. Um, I think that you might agree that uh, the drastic solution of you taking uh, uh, London out of the of, of the data and 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 not keeping it uh, there um, that sometimes many reviewers are asking us to do is yes. not probably the perfect one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, I I I, I think it's really funny when you see these like contingency tables that are like south south minus London London. It's I wish that there was a better way for us to deal with these things, but unfortunately with like scale effects, right? So, yeah. so I just hope that it maybe it's like a generational change in what <laughs> reviewers expect, but um, who knows, it may be kind of slow. I'm young yet, so <laughs> I have hope. <laughs> Me too. Uh, uh, there is a, a question in the chat. So um, I think it's quite uh, provocative. So let me just uh, give it a try. Um, so um, the person, David, uh, is asking, uh, can't place, uh, for example, a state be treated just uh, as a feature and then multi-level model be part of the spatial model in a natural way? Great question, David. Um, so the orange lines that I was using in the in the spatial model um, were, as far as I understand, basically what you're talking about. So we use a dummy there to encode, you know, this county is in this state. So we're sort of turning state into a feature. Uh, and then we're throwing it into a standard single level spatial model. That model's fine, but it doesn't have these desirable properties, which are why people use multi-level models. This kind of improvement in certainty and the possibility of turning something that is not significant because of, you know, low sample size and group, <clears throat> turning that into a significant effect and, and sort of borrowing strength from other observations to improve my estimate. So, so yeah, we can do that. We do it in the paper. It's what we call the, the spatial fixed effect with error, spatial error model. Um, and I showed those results there. Uh, so unless there's something that I'm not understanding uh, in, in that question about how to represent states into a feature, uh, 
I would argue that we do do that and you still see, you know, some desirable properties, but it's not the reason why people use multi-level ones. I also think that also the the spatial configuration at different levels might might be different, right? So yes, then it, it is a, a call for uh, for using a, a spatial kind of component in each different level. Yeah, um, and you can't you can't estimate deep hierarchies in that way because things become too collinear too quickly. Whereas multi-level yeah. models are very very good when you have very nested hierarchies. So lots of different kinds of issues like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Natalie, uh, Natalie Bennett has a question. Natalie, do you want to formulate a question yourself? Um... Hi, yeah, sure. Um, hopefully you can see and hear me okay. Um, yes. I, I'm, not, I'm not coming from a particularly uh, statistical background here and I'm, I'm quite new to the method that I'm using at the moment, which is um, multi-level, multi-group structured equation modeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how you might be able to incorporate this kind of idea of spatial dependence in those kinds of models. Um, I, I'm just, I mean, that might be totally not, not what you're uh, into, but if, if you have any ideas on that, that would be great. Sure. So my understanding is, and I could be very wrong here, but I think that there's, for any structural equation model, there's a corresponding sort of multi-level specification. Uh, so you can usually map between the two. If you can come up with a multi-level model, then you can think about you know, what things are going to have sort of spatial effects. Uh, there's some literature that talks about, you said mental health, yeah? Area effects on mental health. So there's some literature that talks a little bit about how like, you know, if I'm in one neighborhood and you're in another neighborhood and both of them experience the same sort of climactic and socioeconomic conditions, it's likely that our you know, mental health is gonna be related. Uh, and, and so like, I mean, Gareth Griffith at, at Bristol uh, is a colleague in, in epidemiology who's done quite a bit of work on mental health and, and spatial epidemiology uh, and comes exactly from this kind of domain. So uh, there are ways to do it. There are, are packages to estimate these kinds of models that have these notions of dependence. But I guess you, you need to figure out how the dependence fits into your study design. Does it really matter if there's spillovers? You know, are you really trying to say this area is more important than this one? And if you do include the spatial effects and they, you know, mess up what you're interested in, you're going to need to <laughs> reconcile it. Because remember, you're going to be deflating the amount of information that you have if you include spatial dependence. So there are ways to do it, like the HSAR package in R will do multi-level models with arbitrary specifications in that way. I mean, I think BRMS, which is a Bayesian modeling framework in R that uses STAN under the hood, can also fit these kinds of models. Uh, but it just kind of you got to think of what things are going to spill over and then represent them, but you totally can can use this kind of thing in any context. Yeah, thank you very much, Levi. I used to remember you that the recording is going to be available. So very soon at City Ready blog, uh, you will have a blog with a summary of this uh, um, seminar and also uh, uh, the video. So um, for all these references that uh, very kindly Levi is giving to us, uh, you can just pick them up uh, in the recording. Um, uh, Ted, you have a question. Yeah, I've got another question, sorry. Yeah, so you kind of did everything with your spatial dependence going through the error term then. I mean, do the same things, of, you know, if you've got some kind of process where coming through the X or the Y, do you get kind of the same results or is this uh, just to apply to this particular kind of spatial dependence that you talked about? Yeah, great question. So uh, I'll, I'll kind of tackle it in two ways, right? So there are spatial dependence to the Y and spatial dependence to the X that we haven't dealt with in this discussion. Uh, spatial dependence in the X is very interesting because there's a strategy for dealing with that in the multi-level framework as well. It's generally called a cross-classified model. And what you do is you say, this observation is a member of this group, but is also half a member of all the groups that are around it, or, you know, like an eighth of a member if there are eight groups around it. So this kind of geographically cross-classified model is often suggested as a way to kind of do a spatial lag of X model in a multi-level framework. Absolutely fascinating stuff absolutely no formal work on the mathematics of how it goes. It's done in a couple of cases, but nobody knows, you know, the mathematical properties of what that means in terms of dependence and, and power and, and things like that. So we haven't done anything on that either. <laughs> it's quite complicated in, in terms of the, the posterior estimates. In the why, now, um, there's a lot of work that people have done to specify and estimate those models, but again, no formal work. In the paper, we show that Models that do uh, spatial autoregressive treatment in the Y are likely to have even more severe and complex interactions between the two processes. 
dealing with the error term is the simplest possible way to do it. Any Y term is going to include a spatial filter on both the X and the error. So you're going to have the properties of this feedback in a spatial lag of Y model, but it's also going to have other weird behavior. So <laughs> we just showed that it's different and said, someone's going to have to solve this someday and went to analyze this to show how serious the error is in the smallest level, which is the spatial dependence in the error term. Now, if I ever, you know, get time to do it, I'd love to attack that problem, but I actually think it's going to be a little intractable. And generally speaking, I would advise people to move to kind of like conditional specifications if they're more interested in the dependence and the response. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a mess, I think. <laughs> so okay, someone you. needs to take care of it. Well, so, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Levi. I, um, I don't think there is any more question at this moment. I have so many, but uh, I will <laughs> ask you <laughs> in sure. another moment, in another meeting. You can so, always uh, find me on Twitter. I, I, I do yes, answer a lot of questions. Is, there, so. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm encouraged any, 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 any person here, if it is interested, they can follow the conversation as well by dropping an email uh, to Levi. If, if, if you don't have the email address, you can drop an email to me and then I can just pass you the contact. Um, just to say thank you very much, also to congratulate you because uh, I mean, uh, you are still very young, but you are working with uh, two of the top uh, special econom uh, econometricians, uh, Serge and Luke, and this is really, really impressive. So uh, keep on going uh, and <laughs> hopefully we will have you uh, another year uh, in this uh, external seminar series again. I would uh, love that. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, so. Just to all of you, thank you very much for coming today. And uh, next uh, seminar will be in two weeks uh, by Ryan on Puck from uh, Lund University. Uh, and uh, see you soon. Uh, stay well. Great. Good to see you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much, uh, Levi.